I'm going to ask Elder Charles Witten if he would lead us in a word of prayer. And we're going to have Elder Vicki Harcrow come to us. Let's pray together. Father, we bow to give thanks to Thee this night. Thank You, Lord, for the many blessings of life. But most of all, at this time, Lord, we thank You for the privilege and opportunity to be in this house of the Lord once again to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. Lord, we're just so thankful that, that we can be here to hear the gospel proclaimed. Boy, there was Danes mentioned a while ago. We don't know. You know who they are and what they need, and they will supply their own needs. These names it wasn't mentioned, Lord. You also know them. We are thankful. We pray unto a God that knows all things and supplies our many and every need yes. that we need, and we are thankful for that, Lord, and we want to give Thee praise and honor and glory for that. As Brother Ricky comes forth tonight, Lord, give him a message that is good for us, but most of all, Lord, that is pleasing unto Thee, that it be that we can leave this place tonight saying it's a wonderful place to be in the house of the Lord, that we can enrich our lives, Lord, to live closer to Thee. Forgive us the things we do wrong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much uh, the opportunity that you've given me again to be here with you. I've enjoyed the day very much. I appreciate your kindness and your hospitality. And uh, I, I regret that I've had a bout of pneumonia in the last four or five weeks, but I'm glad that I'm able to be here. But I just ask an interest in your prayers. I appreciate the sweet prayer that my friend the Elder Whitney prayed. And I beg an interest that you continue to pray for me for the time that I stand before you tonight. Tonight I want to begin with a very familiar scripture to you Bible readers in the second chapter of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 beginning with verse 5. A little background on the Philippian church. When you study about the Philippian church, you will find out that their fidelity to the service of God and to the ministry is not excelled by any other group of baptized believers in ecclesiastical history. Paul commended them, and in Philippians 1 and 3, he thanked God upon every remembrance of them as he recalled their fellowship and their kindness to him. Time and again they sent to his necessity when other churches had failed to do so. They are an uh, offspring of the Philippian jailer and his family whom Paul baptized in the uh, beginning chapters of the book of Acts in the days of the early church. That being said, Paul comes to the time in this second chapter and he lays out a great doctrinal principle. And in Second Philippians chapter five and or chapter two and beginning with verse five, he says this Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now in these verses of Scripture... Paul sets forth a number of uh, great principles that define and exalt not only God Almighty and His sovereignty and His purpose and in His wisdom, but He also gives us the purpose of Christ and the identity that Christ bore in the earth 
and the oneness that he also held with the Father in heaven. Don't forget that as Christ Jesus made a physical appearance here in the world, he never surrendered his oneness with the Father. Never did he surrender that. The Bible tells me, and if you'll remember in Jesus' going away message in St. John chapter 14 and beginning with about verse 8, a man by the name of Philip began to question and ask the Lord concerning some of the mysteries that his message was shrouded in. And he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Philip said, Have I so long been with you? Have I so long been with you? And you say, Show me the Father. He said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul expresses this same principle, though not in the same words, to his son in the faith, a young man by the name of Timothy. And he said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now what was the mystery of godliness? He begins to describe that. God, number one, God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest in the flesh. And when he talks about being manifest in the flesh, that just simply means he was openly seen or a veil was raised. And then men could see in Christ what they had not seen before. Now, when you go back to the Old Testament, you find so many pictures of Christ. I don't know where you read it and whatever you may read, but I want to tell you, In the Old Testament, Christ is not absent. Amen? In the Old Testament, Christ is there. Whether he stands in the shadows or whether he stands at the forefront, wherever you read in the Old Testament, you find Christ there. He is known in the very beginning, the genesis of the Bible, as the seed of the woman. In Genesis 49 and 10, he's known as the scepter of Judah. In uh, Numbers uh, 24 and about verse 17, he says again that the scepter, the scepter again, the symbol of God's authority, that's what that was. And then you come to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42 and beginning with verse 1, Isaiah calls him, and God calls him, mine elect. Mine elect in whom my soul, the very soul of God, did like it in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he also called his servant. Mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. My servant, in whom I rejoice. So you see, the Lord Jesus Christ here is not only called the elect or the chosen of God, Uh, But he's also called the servant of God. You come to the book of Zechariah, you find that same text again in that same terminology that is used. Uh, He said, my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth in the book of Isaiah. But then you come to the book of Zechariah and he talks about the servant. Uh, And that servant was to build the temple of the Lord. And that servant also was to bear the glory. So now I'm showing you back here where Christ is talked about in prophecy. But did you know Christ made some real physical appearances in the Old Testament? He really did. You know what that's called? It's called a theophanies. That's the term. Don't that do something for you? (laughs) Well, that's what it's called. Now, if you'll go back and you'll find in the day of Daniel when uh, a decree went out from... King Nebuchadnezzar there, you'll find out, and to make a long story short, that uh, three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were cast into a fiery furnace, bound. You know what? They cast those three men in there, bound, hand and foot. The flames came out and devoured the men that 
cast them in, and as they uh, were cast into the burning fiery furnace, you know what they said? You know they said, "Well, now you've prayed to God now uh, that you've prayed to Him to deliver you. Let's see if He will." Well, you know what they said? Right. We don't know whether He will or not, <laughs> but we know He's able. Right. Amen. Amen. We know He's able. Now, you know, they didn't know whether he would or not, but he was able. And I want to tell you, I read in the New Testament where, where uh, God is a God through Christ that is able to do above that which we ask of them. I'll tell you, when they went over there and looked into that fiery furnace, you know what they saw? They saw not only three men that were cast in there bound, but now they were loose. And walking about. But you know what they said? There's a fourth man in there. And he has the form. That's the term now. The form of the Son of God. I'll tell you today. You remember that word form now. That's exactly the term that he uses. Here. The form. He's in form. Like the Son of God. He made a real physical appearance there in the Old Testament in the midst of a fiery furnace. And when they were delivered out of that fiery furnace, uh, it shows how that God does above and beyond that which we ask a thing because not even the smell of smoke was on their clothes. Oh, I'll tell you, you talk about the sovereignty of God and the purpose of His purpose. There it was. Oneness with the Father. He never surrendered that oneness with the Father. And the Bible tells us, and you read again with me in the book of Colossians, and listen to it now, beginning with chapter 1 and beginning with verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him, I want you to get this next word now, that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. That means brought together again uh, with a variance removed uh, that one time separated two parties. All right? Yet now hath he reconciled. How did he do it? Listen to it now. Don't forget my text. In the body of his flesh. Through death. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Brother, I'll tell you right now, you talk about the whole purpose of salvation. You talk about the whole work and uh, 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 contemplation of a God uh, that uh, in all of His purpose, in all of His plan, uh, it pleased the Father. You know I like in the Bible when it says it pleased the Father, don't you? It pleased the Father. Our God is in the heavens, says David. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. You know, I, I, uh, our, our friends out here in the world, they will, they will tell you God can do anything He wants to. And, I, you know, I, I agree with them. You know, they, they, God can do anything He wants to, when He wants to, however He wants to. I read one of these silly signs the other day that said God intervenes but only by invitation. i got a better story for you than that. You hear me? Let me tell you right now, the God I'm talking about, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, uh, can do as He pleases, when He pleases, as He pleases, with whom He pleases. Yes, sir. Our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever He pleased. Now, they tell me God can create a world, but He can't save a sinner against His will. I'll tell you right now, brother, now, you may have heard me say that before. You may have said it here. If I live long enough, I'll say it again. Every sinner that's ever been saved was saved against his will. God willed against the will of the sinner and made him a willing character in the day of his power. That's how God deals with us. Yes, sir. And it pleased the Father that in him, that is in Christ, should all fullness dwell. All the character of the Godhead 
dwelt in the Son of God. The oneness with the Father. You know what Jesus said in His going away message? Uh, in John chapter 17, I believe about verse 12, if you want to read it over there. He talks about those disciples that were there. And He said, Father, keep them as they are one, and that they may be kept as one as you and I are one. John chapter 10 verse 30 says in that great sheep sermon, He says, I and my Father are one. The oneness with the Father. I want you to drive that home to you tonight. And in the fullness of all uh, that Jesus Christ was, He was still one with the Father and having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked work yet now. Brother, let me tell you, you're not going to have to wait till you get to heaven to be reconciled. Amen? Amen. You're reconciled right now. Right now, when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, do you understand that when our Lord went there, He went there for the purpose to reconcile you to God uh, through the death of that Son and through the body of His flesh? You hear me? Through the body of His flesh. He, through that avenue, you who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works in the body of His flesh, through death, shall through that avenue present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. What a wonderful statement that is. Go with me to chapter 2 and beginning with verse 9. Here's the same thought, the same principle again. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness. Get it? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Amen. In St. John chapter 1 and verse 16, Jesus uh, and the writer John uh, began to merge there. And when you begin to hear that and see that, you know what He says? Uh, he says that of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. You know what that means? Grace is heaped upon grace, literally. That's exactly what it means. Grace for grace. Grace heaped upon grace. A while ago, I saw some of you go through the supper line in there, and y'all heap some things up. Amen? <laughs> yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's just one on top of the other. Especially when you got over there the pies and cakes. Well, I want to tell you right now that same principle is involved here. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, has blessed us uh, through the fullness of the Son of God, uh, through the work of the Son of God, through death, burial, and resurrection, He Himself, and of that fullness, how all we receive, and grace heaped upon grace. Amen. Oh, what a blessing that is today for us. But when He went to the cross, his humanity was challenged and His divinity was challenged again. That's right. They in that day challenged His oneness with the Father. Yes, sir. He did. Now, that wasn't the first time that happened. But immediately after He was baptized and Satan went with Him to an exceedingly high mountain. Do you know what? And there, after Jesus has, fa has fasted now, I want you to get this picture. He's hungered. He's hungered, Brother Houston. And Satan appeals to the humanity of Christ. You get it? All right. And not only did he appeal to the humanity, but he denied his oneness or his divinity. He said, Command that these stones be made bread. He was hungry. As a man, he was hungry. Let me tell you right now, Jesus was a man. Don't you forget that. He was a man. How do I know he was a man? Well, first thing I know, he was hungry. Second thing I know, he wept when his friend Lazarus died. Third thing I know is, uh, is that he was wearied with his journey in John chapter 4. He got tired. God doesn't get tired. God doesn't get hungry. Uh, God uh, doesn't do that. But God manifest in the flesh did do that. Yes, sir. All right. Now, 
Satan says to him, command that these stones be made bread. If you're really the Son of God, now look at him, he's challenging his oneness with the Father. If you're really who you say you are, you can command that these stones be made bread. Do you know what Jesus told him? He said, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Answered him right there, didn't he? Oh yeah. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Son of God. I'll tell you right now uh, that Satan challenged his uh, divinity. He appealed to his humanity. And today, uh, even religious leaders say at times, Jesus was a good man, but we don't know whether he was really the Son of God. Men, I'll tell you today, and brothers and sisters, I'll tell you today that men can say what they will. I affirm to you, if you believe these 66 books right here, you will agree with me that He was definitely, uh, without question, the very Son of God manifest in the flesh. Amen. Yes, sir. That wasn't the last time His divinity was challenged. Go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 27, and listen to it. When he was crucified, beginning with verse 39, they went there. And they that passed by, now look, he's at the cross now. We sang that song a while ago and it touches my heart so many times. When he talks about the cross. And he begins to talk about it and as it says this, Dr. Watts wrote it 275 years ago, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my greatest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, love so amazing and so divine demands my life, uh, my soul, my all. And I'll tell you right now, the greatest love and the greatest sorrow that's ever been witnessed by men was seen at the cross of Calvary. Now listen to what took place. As they walked and came by, they reviled Him, wagging their heads. They knew what they were doing. They spit on Him. Do you know what that means? They knew exactly what it was to spit on a man. We want His name put out of Israel. That's exactly what they wanted. That's what that meant. You read Deuteronomy 25. Put his name out of Israel. They spit on him. They whacked their heads. They reviled him. Now this is what? They're challenging his oneness with the Father again. And saying that thou destroyest the temple and build in three days. You remember that's what they, uh, one of the charges that they brought against him. Uh, you said you'll destroy the temple and raise it again in three days. And they were so blind and ignorant. They didn't know he was talking about his own body, did they? That's right. He said, you tear this temple down now and raise it again in three days. They didn't understand he's talking about this body uh, that they looked at. But I'll tell you right now, here they bring it up again. Uh, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. There they challenged him again. If you're really who you say you are, you come down from the cross. But he, they weren't through that. Likewise, the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders. Listen, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. You get that. If he's really who he says he is, he saved others. He cannot save. Let him come down from the cross. And we will believe him. They challenged his oneness with the Father. That's right. Challenging his divinity. I'll tell you, Jesus Christ was there all right. And they spoke truth and they didn't know it. You know what they said? They said he saved others himself. He cannot save. That was the truth. The Lord Jesus went to the cross. And I'll tell you, he uh, could save others, but he would not save himself. Why didn't he come down from the cross? I'll tell you why. Because he was bound by covenant promise. Amen. He was bound by covenant promise uh, made in the ancients of eternity uh, in a great architect of salvation in the work of redemption. Uh, he himself uh, must be faithful to that promise. And I'll tell you today, friend, 
The only reason you'll be in heaven is not because of what you said, what you did, or what you give. I'll tell you, the only reason you'll be in heaven after a while is because of Christ being faithful to the promise that He made. That's the only reason you'll be there. It's because He's faithful. Now, me and you may not be faithful. You know, we may not hold out to the end. Oh, you know, you hear a lot about that. But I'll tell you what 2 Timothy 2 and 13 says, even if we believe not, yet He abideth faith. And aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad of that? Even if we believe not, yet He abideth faith. Oh, listen today. When Brother Paul came on the scene, he began to... Uh, preach this very doctrine and notice the terminology now that he uses in my text. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind of Christ? I'll tell you what it was to do the will of the Father. To do the will of the Father. Listen to John 6, 38 and 39. He said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all that He has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. That was the mind of Christ. Listen to what He says in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 4. Lo, as it is written in the volume of the book, I come to do Thy will, O God. You see? I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus himself said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Time and time and time again, uh, he uh, exonerates uh, uh, God who in judgment, and I'll tell you this today, when our Lord hung down on the cross, my friend, I didn't want to preach and I got here, but I feel pretty good right now. Amen. That's right. Do you know what? Uh, I'll tell you that when the Lord Jesus Christ hung down on the cross, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, looked down and His own mother stood at the foot of the cross, let me tell you right now, He was going to suffer the judgment of a thrice holy God. And I'll tell you, that judgment that He suffered, we're going to be spared judgment through that. You hear me? That's right. Now somebody said, well, preacher, I thought your articles of faith said this. That uh, we believe in a general judgment and a general resurrection. We do believe that. Yes, sir. All men are going to be raised, both the wicked and the righteous, at the last day. That's right. All men are going to be judged at the last day. But I want to tell you the family of God chosen in Christ before the world began. Uh, they're going to be judged not on their faithfulness and not on their work, but they're going to be judged on the obedience, the faithfulness, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, here's the reason that I give my life to spend and be spent in the service of God. Here's the reason that these great men back through here have uh, given their lives in uh, defense of the truth is to tell you that in the last great day when God Almighty, who is judge, counselor, and jury, shall rise up to charge you for every sin that you've committed, thank God, my brother, we'll have a friend in the court. Amen. We'll have a friend there that will say the debt's been paid, it's all been canceled. And say with the Apostle Paul, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more forever. My daughter, just in the next few days, we're going to sign uh, the final papers on adopting children. You know, we've been going through all of that and we, we, we finally got it all, uh, finally got it all lined out. The 19th of this month, we're going to sign the final adoption, uh, decree from the judge. Well, let me tell you something. Living, I live in Alabama, but all that's going on over in Georgia. And I want to tell you, when you go from Alabama to Georgia, you went a long way, brother. I'll tell you that. I mean, you're dealing with a different breed of cat in the state of Georgia. You hear me? Oh, uh, that's right. Amen. Y'all with me now? All right, here we go. All right, I, I wanted to go over that. And I, I thought uh, that maybe if I was over in Alabama, I might help this thing along a little. I, I knew a few people. I, maybe I could help it along a little. I couldn't do that in Georgia. But I wanted to talk to the judge. And uh, the judge uh, was that. He's a very gracious man. He, he gave me an appointment with him. I said, Judge, I said, listen. I said, I know you can't talk to me a lot about this. I'm just because of judicial ethics. I understand that. Uh, but I said, look, I said, our family has been in turmoil uh, just for the last 18 months because we're afraid some quirk in the law is going to take these children away from us. He said, sit down there. And I said, all right. And I did. Now, you know, it's good to do what the judge tells you to do. And I sat down there and crossed my legs and tried to be as nice as I could. And I said, listen. I said, tell me what I need to know. He said, I want to tell you that we've got to go through this legal process. 
He said, do you understand me? I said, I do, I understand. I said, well, what's going to be the end result? He said, I can tell you what's going to be the end result, even though it's not already here yet. I said, well, how can you tell me uh, that everything's going to be all right? He said, because I'm the judge. <laughs> well, you know, that's the best I could ask for, Brother Houston. <laughs> He's the judge. Now, you know why I'm going to tell you that all the family of God is going to be in heaven? Uh, though you are an enemy of God, though you are alienated from God, you know why you're going to be there? You know why that's going to be? Because the judge has said so. That's the promise of the judge. Now, there can be a time when a judge might be bought. <laughs> His ethics might come in question here in time. But I want to tell you, the judge I'm talking about, there's no appeal to be made uh, from his decision. Uh, and here's a judge that can't be bought with the elements of men. Why? Because the word of the judge is law. The word of the Creator judge is law. It cannot be changed. Uh, and because it cannot be changed, the Bible says here, and Jesus Christ uh, began uh, to relate this, and i got to hurry with this, but who being in the form of God. Now what did they see over there in that, in that fiery furnace? They saw a man whose form hear it, was like the Son of God. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You know, some of us, and some of y'all, and a lot of folks have spent a lifetime building a reputation. That's right. It's good to have a good reputation. That's right. I mean, y'all have a good reputation in the community. Y'all have a good reputation uh, in uh, dealing with people. Y'all be honest. Y'all be upright. I mean, uh, that's godly principles. That's Christian character. Amen? Sure. That's right. But I want to tell you something. Your reputation is what men say about you. Now you know Jesus had a good reputation in some circles. Some circles it wasn't so good. Some circles Jesus' reputation wasn't so good. You know what they said one time? They said this man's not a god, he's of the devil. He's casting out devils by bells above the prince of devils. That was his reputation about men. Men said that about him. You know what? Paul's reputation was pretty good in some circles. In others, it wasn't so good. That wasn't so good. His reputation, that's what men said about him. Your reputation is what men say about you. Your character is what you are. Jesus Christ spent his life in making not a reputation. His reputation wasn't so good, but his character was the very character of God. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in that man, Christ Jesus. And now listen to it. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form, here it is again, time and time again, the form of a servant, and was made what? In the likeness of men. And being found in fashion, form, that's exactly, those terms are interchangeable. Fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death, what, of the cross. The death of the cross. I want you to know today that our blessed Lord in all that he was, the character of God was manifest there. And as he looked down and saw them. You know, the Bible even says that he made intercession for the transgressors. Do you remember that? Isaiah 53. He made intercession for those that put him to death, for the transgressors, those that put him to death, those that were on the cross, the transgressors, he made even intercession for them. Listen now. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Even in his humiliation there was exaltation. Even as he was humiliated before the eyes of his own mother. Now a lot of times when you see 
the so-called picture of the Lord, you'll see him on a cross, and you'll see him on that particular piece of wood, and you'll see him with a loincloth around his middle. I affirm to you today, if you'll study about it real close, you'll find out that wasn't the way it was. Part of the shame of the Roman crucifixion was that the naked body of the victim was to be there. Somebody says, Preacher, you mean you believe that? I believe exactly that. I believe exactly that. The shame and the humiliation of the character of man was set before the eyes of those that were there at the crucifixion. And the shame uh, that they brought upon the Son of God uh, there at the crucifixion not only was shameful to the man, it was shameful, no doubt, to those that were there, but even in that humiliation, there was an exaltation before God. Why? Because He was fulfilling every promise that He'd made in a covenant relationship with his father before the world began. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he came to that hour, you you understand this, that it wasn't anything by accident. Read Luke 22, 22. The Son of Man goeth as it was determined. Mm -hmm. Hear that? Wasn't anything by accident about that. Brother Peter preached that on uh, the day of Pentecost and in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 he said him being delivered by the determinate counsel and full knowledge of God ye, not me, but ye by wicked hands have taken and crucified and slain. They wicked hands, wicked men crucified him. <laughs> wicked men did what they wanted to. Their souls were black with sin and they did what they wanted to to the Son of God. But I want to tell you right now, God overruled what they did. God not only rules and super rules, but He also overrules. God overruled what they did. Brought glory to Himself and salvation to you. You see, that's what He's doing. That's what He did. And when God Almighty in His determinate counsel, in His great foreknowledge, in His wisdom and in His purpose, uh, saw and looked down uh, and understood uh, the suffering of the blessed Son of God. I'll tell you right now, it wasn't any surprise to Him. It wasn't any surprise to Him at all. Uh, No, because you read Isaiah chapter 53 and you'll find a description there of what was going to take place. Wasn't any uh, haphazard uh, ideas about it. Everything uh, fell out in its own way. But I'll tell you one thing today. They thought they were through with him. They thought it was done. They said, well, it's over with now. And old, old brother Peter, when, when they took him down from the cross, they said, well, it's over with now. <laughs> we believe we'll just go fishing. And the rest of them said, we believe we'll just go with him. Yeah. You know, it's amazing that here he was three and a half years telling them time after time after time after time. He wasn't going to be with them always and yet uh, the closest followers that he had couldn't put the pieces of that puzzle together. Couldn't do it. But I'll tell you one thing. When he arose from the dead, do you know what? They said that Jesus has rose from the dead and he said, you go tell uh, the disciples and Peter. <laughs> You know, I said, well, oh, well why, why, why did he single out that man? Uh, because I'll tell you, uh, that fellow right there uh, was the one that all the time stood in the front. That man right there was the one that uh, the examples are seen at. You go and tell the disciples and Peter. You say, was Peter not a disciple? Oh, he sure was. But I'll tell you right now, he singled him out. He said, you tell Peter I'm risen from the dead. Uh, because he's done said, he said, we're just going to go fishing. It's dead. It's done and over with. It's over with. Let me tell you right now, my friend, Jesus Christ could have done all that he did. He could have went to the cross. Uh, he could have uh, sighted the blind, caused the deaf to hear, turned the water to wine at Cain of Galilee, uh, John chapter 2. But had he never been resurrected from the dead, he could not have been denominated the Son of God. That was proof positive that he was who he said he was. Proof positive. Therefore, we can say today that in Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He reconciled us to God by the death of His Son. And through that avenue of death, He has reconciled us through His flesh uh, that went to the cross. He has made peace between us and a thrice holy God. Oh, today I tell you that you talk about peace initiative. You know, we, we hear about that all the time. You know, I serve on a committee or two in our nation's capital, and, and we 
uh, do a peace initiative every once in a while to present uh, the Congress every once in a while. I'll tell you, every one we ever did didn't amount to one thing. Not one thing. That's right, didn't amount to one thing. You know, I, I serve on an agriculture committee. We, uh, we, we serve the agricultural interest in the United States. Uh, a lot of times we do resolutions and things like that. But you know what? Doesn't amount to one thing. But I want to tell you right now what Jesus did amounted to something. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> what he did. Now men try to make it void. Uh, men will say, well, uh, if you'll do your part, God will do his. I got news for you, my friend. God done done his part. Amen. And that's enough. You hear me? That's enough. You remember when uh, Jacob pulled that old crippled leg up and he looked out those windows and he saw those wagons coming from down in the land of Goshen? But you know what he said? He said, it's enough. He said, Joseph's alive. <laughs> and I'm going down there where he's at. <laughs> it's enough. Well, I'll tell you right now, what Jesus did was enough, bless God. Amen? Amen. Nothing to be added to it. Can't take anything away from it. Thank God it's enough. It's enough today. And I'll tell you today, because it's enough, uh, you and I uh, can stand here today and leave here rejoicing uh, tonight because the great trumpet of the gospel uh, sounds uh, throughout the kingdom of God and it tells us of a crucified and risen Redeemer who sits now uh, at the very right hand of God and because of who He is, uh, uh, not because of what you are, you understand me today? You're justified today. You're not justified because of who you are. You're justified because of what He is. What He is. And what He is is our intercessor. What He is is uh, the reconciling factor between us and a holy God. I like it when Brother Jacob said, It's enough. It's enough. And you know what I say? It's enough. Thank you. And may God bless you. Brother Scarborough.